afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on Dr. Nancy Live this afternoon. I am so excited. We have a lot of trouble with key eaters in our practice, and we were so lucky to get Melanie to come join us today. She's nationally recognized on picky eating and just phenomenal. So I want to introduce Melanie Potok coming to us from Colorado. Is there any snow there? Where Not you're at? today. <laughs> okay. Talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> we will definitely have some tomorrow. Good. Most people that know me know I love the snow. Uh, I like to go snowmobiling. So Melanie's going to talk to us today about our extreme picky eaters. If you have any questions during the broadcast, please comment and we'll try to get your questions answered um, immediately. If you have any after the broadcast and you see this video, put them in the comments or just instant message us and we'll make sure that Melanie gets them. But we're also going to give you some information at the end of how to get a hold of her personally. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is my favorite topic, kids and food. So oh, you, you have to be careful because I'll I'll be talking to you for days. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us your background about how you got into helping people with um, picky eating. Sure, you bet. So I'm a certified speech language pathologist and not all speech pathologists specialize in picky eating or what we call pediatric feeding disorders. Um, but I was fortunate enough to begin working in the NICU at our local hospital. And often those babies end up with feeding problems when they're six months, two years, even older, uh, because they're behind in development. And that's one thing I want everybody to understand is that feeding is a developmental process, just like learning to crawl, walk, run. I must say that in every interview, honestly, because it's such an important point for parents to understand is that if your child's stalling in their feeding development, they need some professional support to boost them along. And to better answer your question from there, because I started getting so many of those babies on my caseload when they were older, I eventually opened a private practice, left the hospital setting, and now I either do home visits here in Colorado or I do phone consults for both professionals and parents who are just at their wits end on how to help these children learn to love food. So when you say picky eating, I know moms will know what we're talking about, but for those sure. that really don't, can you explain what that, what you're helping with? You bet. You bet. Because picky eating is really an umbrella term. And um, there's, there's a whole spectrum of understanding how children learn to eat. And let, let's just look at that umbrella term, picky eating. Underneath that umbrella, we have our garden variety picky eaters. Those are typically the two, two and a half year olds, they're learning how to say no. They're not really that interested in food all the time because they're busy running about and exploring the world. And they don't have as much hunger anymore because their, their growth has really slowed down. So that, that is where we have this window where kids tend to start to become picky eaters. And then interestingly enough, one out of four typically developing children won't outgrow typical picky eating, one out of four. Wow. And they will that will then morph into what we call a pediatric feeding disorder. And that basically means that there's a gap in that child's feeding development. There are a lot of other reasons kids can develop pediatric feeding disorders, but it can also morph into what we call extreme picky eating or highly selective eating. And although the definition for that is different depending on who you ask. In general, we're talking about these children who have just a handful of foods that they eat every single day. And meal times are stressful. And you put something new on their plate and the world comes to an end. Yes. Or is it the same, like somebody that just eats white food? Is that? Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. The beige diet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. So they don't have to be um, developmentally delayed or anything for these? It's just... No, um, that's such a good point. Again, that one out of four typically developing children will develop some sort of pediatric feeding disorder. Sometimes we call that ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. And that's a diagnosis that these kids can get from a psychologist or a social worker. Sometimes I'll see a pediatrician give that diagnosis. But honestly, it's a pediatric feeding disorder. And I can give that diagnosis. So, okay. A lot of labels out there for the same thing. It's just extreme picky eating. Okay. But even if parents listening have what we consider garden variety picky eating, I hope they'll keep listening because I'm going to be talking about how to make sure it doesn't morph into this more extreme form. 
Okay, so that was my next question. Is there hope for these moms? <laughs> <laughs> There's so much hope. It, it more than hope. There, there are definitely happier meal times ahead. So much good research on how to help these children. And I have the advantage, like you, in that when we're working with kids, we automatically see the light at the end of the tunnel because we know the step-by-step -step process we're going to get, we're going to go through to get them to to better health, essentially. Yeah. But for parents, they're in the trenches day in and day out with these extreme picky eaters or just regular picky eaters. And it can be very, very stressful. Yeah. So it, it definitely not only impacts the child and possibly their nutritional health, but it uh, impacts their emotional health and it impacts the entire family dynamic. It's really complicated. Yeah. So before you give us some tips on how to help this, can you give some tips on kind of settling the mom's mind that it's okay right now, that there is hope? Yeah. What can she do to just, you know, not get so aggravated? Yeah. Well, if we just have your typical garden variety picky eater, the main thing to remember, and it, it's not easy, but man, does it make a world of difference, is that it's your job as a parent to present healthy food, but it's their decision and their job if they're going to eat it. Now that's your typical child who may not have any other issues that we're gonna be talking about that would drive them into the more extreme form of picky eating. If you just got typical two-year-old acting a little picky, here's the two things you need to know. Give them attention for enjoying food. And I'm not talking about good job eating your broccoli. I'm talking about whoa, that broccoli crunches really loud. I'm going to try that too and pick up the broccoli and see if you can crunch it even louder. Kids respond to your attention better than anything. We call that their paycheck. Your attention is their paycheck. So you have to be careful what you pay them for. Likewise, we don't want to pay them or give them attention for not eating. And that's what's so hard because it's really tempting as a parent to say, sweetie, take another bite of that. Or uh, mm, yeah, but finish your broccoli and then you can have dessert. You know, we've all been there, but there's very good research that shows that if we even gently pressure our children to take another bite, it actually doesn't do any good. The, the kids don't, um, they don't end up gaining more weight. They don't end up getting better nutrition. It just makes the parent feel better. So don't do it. Don't do it. Bite the tongue. How many moms are guilty of that? Click like. If <laughs> <laughs> I had my own very, very um, picky eater before I ever got into this field. And I know how hard it is yes. not to ask for another bite, but do your best not to do it. I have lots of information about that on my website. And if you just Google POTOC, my last name, P-O-T-O-C-K, and pressure, you'll see an article for CNN um, where I, I help that reporter understand that. Uh, very recent research. So I hope that'll be a good one for everybody That's to look awesome. up. And I'm happy to send you that link as well. Okay, great. So let's move into the extreme picky eating, the um, tips you have for those parents. Okay, great. But I'm so sorry. Everyone's going to laugh. We are babysitting my daughter's puppy. And I'm about to sneeze because I'm allergic to dogs. <laughs> oh, no. Excuse me. <laughs> We don't have okay, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> this puppy is so good and so cute, but my allergies are running rampant. So bear oh, with no. me. <laughs> All righty, let's talk about how to prevent a kid from becoming a picky eater, an extreme picky eater. I'm going to take you all the way back to when kids first start solids. Not to say that early breast or bottle feeding doesn't also come into play here, but just to keep this kind of concise for your listeners, I'm gonna give you five different points. First, let's go back to about six months of age when our babies are starting solids. The main thing we have to think about there is that we, we really want these kids to eat a variety of safe solids. And I know it's really popular nowadays to follow a baby led weaning model. I have a book called Baby Self Feeding, which follows the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for helping children start with solid foods. What I want you to know is that when babies are first starting, you absolutely can offer purees. You absolutely can offer what I call squishable solids. So that would be like 
pieces of avocado or um, gosh, some really, really um, oily toast, you know, something that they can almost squish in their mouth. I want you to think about what it's like not to have teeth and what you're going to squish with your tongue. Those are the kind of foods we're going to offer to babies. And it's totally fine to have a little bit of spice and flavor in there. I have a lot of articles about that on my website. Just look for my feeding babies tag on my blog and all of these will pop up for you. Um, so offer flavor, offer a variety of textures, and don't worry about also offering purees. Purees actually have a purpose. From a speech language pathologist standpoint, the reason why we like babies to have purees is it's essentially a thickened liquid and they start on liquids. So when we thicken up a liquid a little bit into say an applesauce puree, then kids learn how to manage that food and swallow safely before they get to the more challenging foods. But you don't have to start with purees and go there for weeks. You can offer safe solids and purees all at the same time. Secondly, what I want you to know that if your child has not progressed to age appropriate safe solids past age nine months, in other words, they're stuck on purees, you absolutely must talk to your pediatrician about that and request a feeding evaluation by a certified speech language pathologist like myself or an occupational therapist who specializes in pediatric feeding. Now that's really important. Not all SLPs, not all OTs have the advanced training in pediatric feeding. So we need someone who really, really, that that is their passion and what they focus on 24 hours a day. All right. And likewise, um, number three would be by age 12 months or one year, everybody's gonna listen to this because I know that people are gonna cringe. You got to get them off the bottle and you got to get them off the pacifier. I love a good pacifier. There's a lot of great reasons for a baby to have a pacifier or to even um, suck on anything, but we don't want it to continue past age one. As a matter of fact, right about seven, eight months, I like babies to only have a pacifier in the crib just for self-soothing. Past the age of one, the reason why we don't want babies to have anything over their tongue, like a bottle or a pacifier, breastfeeding is fine, is that, 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 let me show you with my straw. Okay. This is your pacifier, let's say. If the pacifier is right over the tongue, it holds it down. Yeah. On my website, I have a special tab called free toolbox, and that's where you're going to find lots of free downloads for parents and professionals to learn from. And one of them is how to teach your child to drink from a straw, but we're not going to drink from a straw like this. That's the same thing as pacifier. We want the tip of the straw to go right to the tip of the tongue. So they learn to drink from a straw like this. Why? Because we want the tip of the tongue to go up to what we call the alveolar ridge. So right here, watch. And the reason why is that alveolar ridge where you say a D or a T, it's that spot. That's what happens at about 12 months. We start to develop what's called a mature swallow pattern where the tongue tip, instead of pushing forward, actually pushes up. And it's that mature swallow pattern that helps kids learn to eat a variety of foods. Kids often come to me at say 15 months of age and they're on still on a bottle or still on a pacifier and they've never developed that new motor pattern and they can't get the food back to be swallowed. So they keep spitting it out. And the parents like, he doesn't like it. He keeps spitting it out, but that's not true. He can't, he doesn't know how not to spit it out. He hasn't learned how to propel it back and to advance to more foods because now we've got teeth for chewing you got to be able to do that. You got to have a mature swallow pattern. I was back up when they're starting to eat and they spit their food out and they said, uh, oh, they didn't like that. Is that the same thing? Oh, well, gosh, really close. So we've okay. got a slight difference here and I'm really glad you brought it up. At six months of age, babies have a reflex called a tongue protrusion reflex, or sometimes we call it just a protrusion reflex. And sometimes you'll hear parents call it a tongue thrust reflex. But what it is, remember, it's a reflex. So the, the tongue is taught to go forward like that from birth, to push anything out, but also to help strip milk from the breast. And it also works for bottle feeding. 
However, once they progress onto solid foods, the way nature works is it makes that reflex begin to integrate or dissipate into the body. So by 12 months, it's absolutely gone. So if they're still pushing it out at 12 months of age, it's no longer reflexive. It's a learned behavior okay. and it's a learned motor pattern because something held their tongue down like a thumb or a pacifier or a hard spout sippy cup. We really want to stay away from those as much as we can, as much as we can. Okay. So I hope that that helps you at that point. Yeah. It's a learned behavior and no longer a reflex. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Okay, sorry I to interrupt you, but oh no, no, you interrupt me anytime. Like okay. I said, I talk for days about this. My favorite thing. I talk about it in my sleep. Oh. <laughs> so finally, um, gosh, there are so many resources on my website because we don't have that much time together. But one thing you'll often hear is how important it is from a young age, and I'm talking about six months to a year, and on up into high school to have regular family meal times. But in this day and age with especially both parents often outside the home, they both have uh, jobs outside of, of taking care of their children. It's tricky to have regular family meal times. And I, I really ask parents to try to find at least three times a week and then build from there. Maybe it's breakfast, maybe it's Saturday lunch and you're at the local pizza shop, but you're together, mm -hmm. no electronics, just all of us having a conversation around our meal. The reason why that's so important is not only are you modeling healthy eating for your child, but you're also modeling how to chew, how to bite and tear, how to take a drink when you're feeling a little uncomfortable, like, oh, I've got something in the back of my throat, so that you don't gag, so that you don't spit it out. Babies are great observers, as are toddlers, and they learn from all of our behavior as well. Quick note on that. Um, the other thing you need to know about family meal times is there's excellent, excellent research. I actually have it all listed for you in the book that's right over my shoulder here, Adventures in Veggie Land. The research behind family meal times not only shows that it helps to boost reading skills, it helps to boost early language development in your toddler, but for your middle schoolers, teenagers, et cetera, it makes sure that those kids make better decisions in life. We know for sure that kids who have at least five family meal times a week, those kids are less likely to try drugs. They're less likely to try alcohol too early in life and also to have sexual relationships too early when they're not ready. It helps with peer relationships. So if you start it early, it'll help you to raise a healthy, happy kid from yeah. the very beginning. And then very last note, I know we have to take some questions oh, too. Okay. Is on my free toolbox tab, I can put the link in your comments for you. Um, you'll find a schedule that'll say the ideal schedule for toddlers to keep them on a regular meal and snack time schedule. Don't worry about the toddler part. It's true for all kids. Keep your kids on a regular meal and snack time schedule so they come to family meal times hungry, not hangry, yeah. just hungry and willing to try new foods. Let's try to get out of this grazing trap that we all tend to do. That's true. Yeah, we do have a great question here. And this is um, uh, very common. Um, Bree has an extremely picky eater, and I know this little guy, he is very picky. Um, he loves veggie straws, but only picks out the orange ones. So she wants to know if it's bad, if she always gives it to him in a separate bowl right away, or should she let him pick them out himself, or what should she do about that? That's a great question. Three things I talk about in Adventures in Veggie Land, which is right over my shoulder here, and also in Raising Health, a Healthy Happy Eater, which was written with pediatrician Namali Fernando. Three things we really focus on, expose, explore, explain, expand. And what she's doing a wonderful job is exposure. So that's what she's focusing on first. And that's what we all want to focus on first. Exposure means that you have visual and maybe even some tactile exposure, maybe some, um, some aroma um, to various foods. And when she's putting the different veggie straws with the orange one, his favorite, in the same bowl, she's honestly halfway home. So we don't want to back up from there because that's really good progress. That he's willing to tolerate the same colors with the orange straws. What he's doing, however, is he's picking up the orange ones and he's only eating those. 
the next step from there would be to encourage him to pick up the other ones. He doesn't have to bring them up to his mouth yet, but just to pick them up. So the way we typically do that in feeding therapy is through food play and just come up with lots of fun ways. I don't know how old this child is, but lots of fun ways to get him to engage with the other colors with no pressure to eat it. And then once he's willing to engage with it and play with it, maybe you're going to um, make some pictures with it. Maybe you're just going to crumble the different colors on a paper plate, uh, whatever you'd like to do, just get kind of crafty. Mm -hmm. Then we can start to work on bringing it up to our mouth. And we usually start with a lick, just licking. Ooh. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So we do have another question about, um, let's see, what have you seen work best for those moms that have let the passy go a bit in the past and um, looking to wean them now? Well, um, I have three tips for you on that on my YouTube channel, which is totally free. I'll, I'll put the link in the comments for you on that, as well as the specific videos for you, Jennifer. And then I also have this in Raising a Healthy Happy Eater. But let me tell you what my personal favorite is. I talk to the kids about broken, about broken. So right at about nine months of age, um, I really want the kids to understand if something's broken and I'll leave like a, a couple yellow pencils and I'll break them in half and I'll leave them around the house and I'll say, oh, it's broken. I can't fix it. And I'll have the kids go throw it away. Then when we're ready to get rid of the pacifier, make sure you gather up every pacifier. Look under the car seats. Look under your car seat. Make sure they are never going to find some random one that you didn't see. Gather them all up. Pitch all but one. And then I usually recommend this on a weekend when you can do it because you got to be brave, parent bravely. What I want you to do is actually, again, if this were a pacifier, cut off the tip of the pacifier and make sure you throw that away where the kid can't find it because that would be chokeable. And then leave it in their crib or their bed. And they're going to pick it up and they're going to say, and get it on video because it's heart wrenching, but so cute too. They'll go, woke it, woke it. <laughs> And you have to pair it bravely and say, oh, yeah, it's broken. Can't fix it. I usually recommend doing this around trash day. Let's go put it in the trash. We'll go put it in the trash. The kids will be so upset for about one day. And then I promise you they're going to be okay. Be sure, though, that you give them something else that they can put in their mouth. And I usually recommend tying the pacifier with some sort of stuffed animal or blankie. You want to link those two together so they still have their lovey so they can comfort themselves, but they also need some oral input. So let me show you. I'll grab something out of my drawer real quick here for you. A few ideas around that. Um, it could be any sort of chewy but I love anything, say this shape, where they could hold it and really chew on it. And it gives them something to get that oral input because they need that to help them calm down. But they won't become dependent on this the way they do with the pacifier. Oh, good. So Brie also asked about, um, what about the one bite and you can spit it out rule? Is that okay? You know, in feeding therapy, where the kids come to us with significant issues, sometimes therapists will make that rule because they want the kids to feel safe. If you have a child who's just your garden variety picky eater, you absolutely can establish a rule in your family that's we take a bit of everything or we take a taste of everything. So that way, if the taste is just a lick or the taste is biting and needing to spit it out, that's okay. But when you sort of have, have more of a general comment like that. We take a taste of everything and we don't, we don't add in and then you can spit it out. You're setting the child up for success. In our family, we take a taste of everything. Mm -hmm. And then it's your choice if you want to have more. So whether they choose to lick it or they choose to bite it and spit it out or bite it and swallow it, they took their taste and then it's up to them if they want more. And you, you will never, ever ask them to take another taste, you know, of that one food. Last point on that, though, is the reason why we do that is all the research shows that all the research shows that if kids take repeated tastes over time, they learn to eat new foods. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's 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 how I learned to drink coffee. That first sip was like, oh, <laughs> but now I'm I, you know, I'm all about the coffee. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Yeah. I have also I've heard that if you try something 10 times, you'll like it. <laughs> 
you heard that? There is some research that shows that, but um, there's also research that shows that kids need to be exposed to new food more than 15 times, up to 30, not to even like it, just to enhance their acceptance of it. So that might be that they accept it on their plate. The bottom line is offer it over and over and over, not every day, but yeah. over and over. And in the course of a year, your kids will get a lot of exposures. That's awesome. I'm still working on that with mushrooms with my daughter. <laughs> She'll get there. She'll, She'll get there. there. She's a teenager. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't think we have any more questions, but we've already posted some links that you've mentioned um, on our um, page. Um, the website to go to um, MelaniePotak.com. And she's got so much information on there. She's got books that she's written. She's got articles. She's got tips. Um, so please go there. Um, peruse the website and she also will do remote consultations if you um, want to talk to her specifically about your extremely picky eater eating child um, she's willing to do that um, if we have no more questions um, I'm going to thank you very much for joining us today do you have anything else that you want to add that we didn't cover Sure, sure. You know what? Because I'm doing something special in 2020. Um, I also have a Facebook group in addition to my Facebook page. My Facebook page is My Munchbug Melanie Potok, and the link may already be there. I'll, I'll add it in a little bit here for everyone. But um, uh, the the Adventures in Veggie Land Facebook group, it's a private group. You got to ask answer three questions to join. They're really easy questions, I promise, but it's just so the group doesn't get hacked, you know? And then um, so ask to join, answer the three questions real quick and come and join us because in 2020, I'm helping everyone learn or teach their child how to love 20 different vegetables in 2020. Okay. And this week I just posted three new videos all about how to learn to love squash. And I think the tips are really going to surprise a lot of people. It's super fun. We have parents and professionals. We have over, uh, over 4,400 members now. Wow. So I hope everybody will join me there too. And, and thank you for having me here today and, and all the good work that you're doing for families to raise healthy, happy eaters because chiropractics, um, the practice of chiropractic is, is, is a big part of what I do as well, because it's about the child's overall health. Right. So having someone like you on our team to help these kids get to healthier eating is essential. Yes. It's, it's wonderful how it affects the eating. I've, I've been amazed. <laughs> I never yeah. know. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And yeah. thank you, everybody, for answering questions. If you know somebody that has an extremely picky eater, please share this video with them. And then share her website, too, with everybody. Thank you again for joining us. And I hope you get some snow in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> I'll invite you out to go snowmobiling. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.